Only joking, or am I? I am the one and only. Just so happens I probably am. There was going to be a strike to bust today. I'm frustrated. There was no strike to bust. I did it all day last Tuesday. It's great fun. You just go up to the picket line, you bust through, you annoy everybody, then you go inside, make a load of private calls. Don't do any work. Ah. In certain circumstances, it may be necessary and sensible to administer smack to your child. Okay, so in today's toxic gob, your chance to speak in Call 1FM. That's our new phone-in with Peter Hamill, the subject today, Animals and Justice. We'll be looking at strike beating. What happens if you call up Tory Central Office and ask them for the news 24 hours in advance? Uh We're trying to skirt possible industrial action tomorrow, which will threaten the news bulletins. We're not sure if it's going to happen. You may know the parties are at ACAS, but there is a threat of unofficial action. Right. By recording uh, as much of the news as possible today and then using it tomorrow. Right. Is there anything that you could say which would still be extant in 24 hours' time? Well, I suppose uh, I mean, we could find some ministers who might talk about the importance of the European, uh, uh, European election. With the European election? Uh, yeah. More of that in 10 minutes. Also, uh, if you want to call 0716374343 now and uh, enough people call, I will repeat that up John libel that cost the BBC £1.5 million in the week. There'll be opaque rambling from my man Sergeant Murphy. Human projectile Peter Bainham will bring back a celebrity's trash can. We'll sort out exactly who in a minute. We'll sort through the gin dinge and let you know what's there. Uh, we're reviewing the virgin book of legal highs. And... As uh, the news spouts ever more from the news horse, we'll keep you abreast of it. Uh, Tonight, Jimmy Savile drops dead at a charity bash. The patients at Stoke Mandeville Hospital are not grieving. The majority, if not all of them, are extremely relieved that he's now dead. Although I suspect that some of them will be sorry that he he didn't suffer a great deal more before. Yeah, you see that um, Max Clifford has been hired by the the people who are alleging that Alan Clark had an affair. Well, the the judge is alleging that Alan Clark had an affair with uh, all three of his ladies. And uh, I hope Max Clifford does better for him than he does for, um, who was the previous client? Bienvenida Buck. There was, um, I know, I saw actually the the press launch of um, four, four weddings and an F. That uh, he was still, still trying to get pressed for Bienvenida Buck. Um, what she was doing, she went Nicholas there. She got out of a taxi, uh, threw her skirt over her head. Nobody paid the blindest bit of attention. Got out, went round the other side, got in again, got out again, threw her skirt over her head again. Absolutely no reaction at all. Even started firing ping pong balls off. Well, she stood on the top of the cab, started firing ping pong balls, Bangkok uh, whorehouse style, at the press cordon. Absolutely no reaction whatsoever. Somebody sort of saying, "Oh, it said somebody put these ping pong balls in the seafood. Nothing more." Um, I hope it does better for them. Peter Bainham. Um, who can we? Who can we? Uh, we've got a couple of people in town. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Emma Thompson. Uh, yeah, Emma Thompson's around. in town. Okay. Well, the, the deal here is that uh, Peter's agreed to go out and get uh, their trash can. Yeah, yeah. All right. So if you can do that in about twenty, if you can make it twenty-five minutes. Yeah. I think they're staying in Bayswater. Okay. Yeah. Bayswater. So right, Emma so. Thompson and whoever she's with staying Bayswater. in Bayswater. Go and get the uh, trash can. Be back here in twenty-five. Will do. Okay. See you later. And up next, uh, those calls, basically strike-busting yesterday, phoned up a few people and said, listen, can you give us a comment for the news 24 hours in advance so we can beat the strike? And they said, yeah, sure. Um, Now, this deal with the news, basically yesterday there was threatened industrial action. So I phoned up a few people, said, uh, look, we're trying to plan ahead for the news, we're trying to record the news 24 hours in advance. Would you be able to do anything? I got through the Tory central office, they were more than obliging. They bent over backwards, they said, yeah, we could put you in touch with some top-level politicians, no trouble at all. So straight away they uh, put the phone down. Then they phoned up John Selwyn Gummer. Then I phoned him up two minutes later. Hello? Hello, is that Mr. Gummer? Yes. I don't know if you're aware of the situation, but basically there may be industrial action tomorrow which uh, threatens to undermine the news bulletins, obviously. Yes. And in order to supermount the trouble, we're trying to record as much of the news as possible today. Of course, I understand. So if there's anything uh, you want to say which you feel will be extant in 24 hours... Well, I think the thing that will be extant is the, um, uh, the major issue about vetoing. Right, well, can we record a statement on that now for tomorrow's news? Yeah. Um, one for tomorrow morning's news and one for tomorrow evening's news. Slightly different. I see what you mean, yes, indeed. So, so what would be the first one? Well, the first one is that I uh, am 
very... Con- I, no, it's, sorry, I'll do it. OK. Let me, let me cut, I'm trying to think about how to do the two things. Yes. Sure. Over and over again, Britain needs to have her veto, not as a threat, but because everybody then knows that when things of great national importance comes up, she's not pushed to the brink. That's why the veto's vital. Now, if it's going to go high in the bulletin, it will probably benefit from a swipe at one of the opposition parties. Uh, Right. Would you like to change that in any way? Well, I'd just say, um, I'm... The British people must be appalled that the Liberal Democrats are so split over the veto. It's quite clear that the major spokesmen like Sir David Steele want to get rid of Britain's veto. We can't have that. I think the Liberals are selling Britain down the river. Uh, Would you like to perhaps put out something about the Labour Party? You've mentioned the Liberals there. Uh, Something about the Labour, if you could give them a bit of a wigging. (laughs) Yeah. Labour has uh, signed up with the European Socialist Manifesto. So they've joined the Liberals on saying that Britain can be members of the European community without any veto over the matters that really matter. And I'm sorry the Labour Party has joined the Liberals in that. So basically, there he was, and the, the one thing more ticked over. I thought, well, if, there's a, if it's 24 hours ahead, the, the situation might change. Labour, uh, not up, up, uh, holding the right for veto, may do a vault fast and suddenly say, oh, no, after all, we are going for the veto. So then what happens? Right, now, let's just look at the possibility that during the course of the day, Labour have reversed their attitude on the veto. What do you say then? Well, if Labour's now pretending it, uh, <laughs> it wants to keep the veto, that's the seventh change on Europe that it's had in almost as many years. Ah. Now, if it says it wants to keep the uh, British veto, then how could it go on being part of the Socialist Union of Parties? It doesn't stand up. This Labour Party will say anything to get a vote. OK, so this hasn't even happened yet, and he's that angry. There's more. There's one more. The, 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 he, 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 like, pushed another inches towards the peak. Probably do that in two minutes. But he was angry about a fiction. It's a soundbite mentality for you. OK, uh, the last blip of uh, John Selwyn Gummer getting angry about a fiction. Basically, I put to him the fiction that, uh, that, that Labour had reversed their policy. This doesn't even happen. Labour reversed their policy on uh, the Euro veto, and he went like this. Do you think they'd say anything just in the interest of appeasing a few voters? Well, I'm sorry about the Labour Party, but clearly it doesn't want to have any policies lest anybody be put off from it. And they're very upset that we flushed them out on the issue of the veto. Now we've pushed them and flushed them out. They're frightened and they don't want to stand up to what they signed up for only a couple of months ago. Right, Mr. Gower, thank you very much. Right, OK. OK, okay bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Chris Morris, 1FM. Now, drugs. Most ways of getting high are illegal, and in this country, whilst it's punishable by law, quite definitely the case here, with campaigners constantly fighting for their legalisation, so it looks like remaining unlikely to be changed. However, from next Monday, Virgin Publications release a new book, which you may find useful if you want to get high, but remain within the law. I'm joined in the studio now by Hugh Matoklin, uh, who runs a head shop in Covent Garden. He's here to help review the book and to look at some of the methods that you can use quite legally to get corked. Good evening, Hugh. Hello there. Now, looking at the book, it gives a brief history of the mm-hmm. drugs that you used to be able to get in f- normal food stuff. Yes, it does. It's a fascinating uh, little bit of history at the beginning there, where it sort of talks about these products that had uh, various things. I mean, it talks about the one which we all know, which was uh, Coca-Cola used to contain cocaine. And Horlicks used to contain a gram of heroin. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Now, what about these ways of getting high, the sort of the school kids stuff, yeah, you know, the bay leaves? It sort of jumps on all those things, like, you know, like you said, bay leaves, nutmeg, banana skins, crumbling up banana skins, smoking little reeds of grass. Uh-huh. Quite rightly, it poo-poos all that. Yeah, of, poo-poos them. Like, poo-poos them, yeah. yes. Uh, but then it moves on to the one I, which I remember doing um, a lot of the time, which was uh, if you take a saxophone, mm-hmm. fill it with honey, smoke a spider plant through the honey. Bubble it through the honey? Yeah. What's, what's yeah, that yeah. called? Uh, that's called sweetsophoning. And how does that work? What does it do well, to you? Well, basically, it just leaves you very, very, very calm for about three days afterwards. Excellent. And yeah, then there's this good. one here, don't speak for a fortnight, very cheap. Now, if you don't speak for a fortnight, what happens? You basically get a build-up well, what of you chemicals. get is, yeah, you get a build-up of non-expressed word chemicals, right. which will, just after about two weeks, because normally they get burnt out, after about two weeks, then they, they will peak. just 
they will just fly off and you'll be very, very high. Off your very face. Good, yep. Now, there's the old mice, mouse in a motorcycle helmet. Yep. That works pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a little thing with you there, which is kind of like a, a thumbnail-sized little piece of brass. Yeah, what yeah. That? What this is, this is a fly kettle. We retail this in the shop for about £19.99. Right. Uh, what it does, use it for in, uh, boiling an individual fly. Mm -hmm. uh, what it does, it extracts the resin, you drink the resin, gives you a very sort of short-lived but very, very powerful high. <laughs> I you know, suppose like a bit of a buzz. It certainly induces a sense of euphoria, yeah. Now, perhaps the best method of all here, because it can be done in groups, it's quite a social thing, is this thing where you, you go, you find a field of grazing cows, and you mm -hmm. basically climb inside a cow. You That's cut a right, slit yeah. behind the rib cage, yeah. and you climb inside the cow, and then lie on top of the rib cage with your That's face right. stuffed into the body, your feet sticking out of the back, mm -hmm. and, you, and you get a slow well, high from this. How does that happen? Well, what happens is that um, it releases endorphins, a huge amount of, obviously a cow's a big animal, mm. huge amount of endorphins are released into the wound, and then they just enter your body through your forehead or whatever. So the cow know. stands there quite calmly grazing away, doesn't even yeah, notice yeah, that yeah. all those endorphins are around. Yeah, and it. this has a technical name. Oh yes, it's that's known as riding the black and white bus. Now, there's one thing. We'll come on to look at the, the loopholes around street drugs in just a moment. Yeah. I just must ask you, something in your shop I saw the other day when I went in to research right. this, was a, a, a pair of underpants, a pair of yeah. pink ladies' pants. Um, and on the front was a plastic disc containing all the paraphernalia used for taking crack cocaine. And yeah. it had a little a file of crack. That's right. Now, presumably when you flog that, you don't expect people to take the drug. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just, just, just for fun. I mean, if the, the cocaine, the crack inside it is very, very poor quality stuff anyway. I mean, I wouldn't recommend just, it. I just wanted to make sure. I'll be kidding. Yeah. Okay. Later. Oh, hang on. It wasn't meant to be this one. It could be this one instead. Uh, um... No. Yeah, I knew there was a reason for it being this one. Probably sick of this, you know, it's the one that goes... Once there was this kid who sang in such a stupid voice that he thought sounded cool. He didn't have the sense to read. A lies. It sounded like he was forcing a stool. Uh, he thought, he thought he sounded like thunder, but he was just a one at wonder. And you can't know the rest, really. Okay, meanwhile, here is a smart ass American that is fun to spend time with. Now, Call 1FM is uh, the part of the programme where we like to give you the chance, we shut up and you do the talking, you the chance to mouth off about various issues of concern. And this is our first. Call 1FM is basically your phone-in. Call 1FM. Time now for you to express your views on the air in Call 1FM. Here's Peter Hamill. Hi, Peter. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Yep, I'm fine. Can't say you look so well, must I? <laughs> Call us now on 071-637-4343. That's 071-637-4343. The subject today, animals and justice. Hi, you're through to Call 1FM. Who's on line 26? It's Atul Shah here. Yep. Basically, I'd like to say that uh, I do feel that animals have uh, feelings. Are you saying that animals have a sense of justice which is simpler and in some ways better than our own? Yes, yes, I do. Um, I mean, uh, but I think what's, what's happened with man is that we've become more sophisticated. And the more sophisticated we've become, the further away we've gone from what is natural. If I write it down, it is sophistication does not equal. It's that, that like a British Rail sign, yes. does not equal good. Yes. What can we learn for our own sense of justice uh, from the animal world? And how can we apply it in the way that we seek to provide justice for ourselves? Um... Uh, really, I think, you know, if, if you look at how animals um, rear their young... With a horse, when its uh, foal has just hatched, it's very, very, uh, very, very, very nice to it, isn't it? Mm. Mm -hmm. Or rear, anyway, yes. Yes. A, um, horse, a horse rears. Sorry? What are you talking about, exactly? Well, you know, how they, how, they, how they interact with their young. If they're mammals, it's tongues, maybe, isn't it? Yes. What about birds? I think, I think birds also have a, a very close bonding. You only have to look at some, something like penguins who... who sit in the Arctic for six months, um, you know, with the egg on their feet, uh, waiting for it to hatch. Can you think of an example of penguin immorality which you would not expect the emperor or rock hopper to commit? Crime. Well, uh, war, for example. Penguin war? Yeah. What would penguin war involve if it broke out? Um, sort of, you know, clump of penguins clubbing together to, to, to... Screaming towards each other, heads held low across the ground. Yeah. Impolation and damage. 
at yes. the end of it. Yes. If you saw that, how would you feel? Oh, it would make me feel very sad. Thank you for calling Call 1FM. Your call has released a just dog. Thank you. Hello, line 140. Who's there? Yes, hello. I'm David Chilliston. And what's your point, please? Well, my point is uh, the animal attitude towards justice is that those who don't fit the um, species norm... The species who? The, the species norm. Yep. Peter, but yep. Yes, that's, uh, that's right. Uh, what, uh, what I'm saying is that the emulation of some animal um, justice characteristics uh, might help us uh, uh, to produce some order out of the chaos. Let me ask you this. We're pushed for time, but what animal characteristics would you like to see emulated in a courtroom? Um, Mountain gorilla? Uh, yes, in actual fact, the uh, gorilla community is, is very good. What sorts of mountain gorilla behaviour would you like to see brought into a courtroom? Oh, I, the as aspect of intolerance, of antisocial behaviour. That intolerance expressed by facial expression? Yes, uh, other physical posturing and, of course, the aggressive pose, the attempted broadening of the uh, uh, shoulders. Flaring of nostrils? Yes, as if to infer some imminent physical violence. What about the bounding from one region to another at high speed? Oh, yes. Yes. Would the move towards a mountain gorilla be a gradual thing? Yes. And it would, would have to be, otherwise it would be unacceptable to the population. Your call has freed one just dog. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Call. More calls on your opinions on animals and justice after this noise. I think I should talk to Keith. Hello, this is Peter Hamill. You're through to Call 1 FM. The subject today, animals and justice. If you have any comments to make at all on that subject, phone us now and put your opinions through to the air. Hello? Yes, hello, Paul. What's your point? You're talking about animals and justice. That's right, yeah. Mm, good. Well, animals can sense uh, right from wrong because um, they normally pick it up from their, their owners. So, are you saying that animals are sort of acting out a little play for us to follow? Well, it could be that way, yes, yes. And what animals do you think are best at doing that, acting out a little play for us to follow? Um, well, the dogs. The dogs are mainly uh, our pack animals, aren't they? So what percentage of your time would you say you need to spend watching the dogs? Uh, maybe 15 percent. 15 percent of your time. And yeah. what percent of time do you think people spend watching the dogs at the moment? Uh, about 2 percent, I should think. And when you think of the injustice in the world, how does that make you feel, bearing in mind that people only spend 2 percent of their time watching the dogs? Well, I mean, it's, it's not good enough, is it? And when it comes to leaders of countries that perpetuate cruelty, how much time do you think they spend uh, watching the dogs? Well, they, they don't spend any time, I shouldn't think. No time at all no watching the dogs? All, no. And would they need to go into some sort of remedial dog-watching class in order to catch up? And if so, how much time should they spend watching the dogs? Well, maybe 50% of their 50 time. 50% of their time. Yeah. So we're talking somebody like Pol Pot. Think about what he did to people. Mm -hmm. How much time would you recommend he spent watching dogs? Pol Pot, about 90%. Thanks for calling. You'll no be problem. glad to know that your call has freed a just dog. Oh, great, great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, Line 7. You're through to Call 1FM. Who's there? Katie Boyle. Katie Boyle. Listen, I'll thank you for calling now, just in case we get into an argument and I have to cut you off. Oh, <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. I think we'll probably agree. Absolutely. Okay, what's your point? <laughs> oh, I've got so many points. Um, dogs, animals in general, but dogs in particular, we can learn so much from them. You can teach, for instance, mothers who won't discipline their children, who have no idea how to bring up a child. They should only watch a bitch with their, with their youngsters. Let me come in like a juggernaut here and say, are you suggesting that they could be used as an example in social work? Oh, yes, tremendously. And what Very much so. For instance, pet dogs, for instance, pets with, on therapy. A therapy is absolutely pets fascinating. Pets on therapy, yeah. Yes, they're wonderful in hospitals and watching them. I tell you what, Katie, what we're talking about here and what some of the other callers have mentioned too is Padge. Pets as jury. Oh, yes, very much so. They so, have an inborn sense of fairness. And if you were in court and the prosecuting lawyer brought in a dog and the dog reacted badly to the man in the dock, what decision would you make about the man in the dock? I'd, I'd be very wary of that man. So your, your, your ear would be cocked in the direction of the possibility that he was more wrong than right? Without a doubt. Let's be specific here. It would have to be a neutral dog. You'd have to have a neutral dog, But naturally. what sort of dog would be best at well, providing that, that diagnosis depends. in a court of law? I would have thought of a, a, a Rottweiler, a, a Doberman. So a good animal for pet as jury would be the Rottweiler, yep? Uh... Rottweiler, Weimaraner uh, uh, would be a very good one, and a Doberman would be a very good one, German Shepherd too. What about wild animals? Wild animals, well, well, of course, the wolf. The wolf is a dog. Sure. Now, let's look at the rather sad issue of animals in war. Yeah, oh. What's uh, your feeling about that? Mm. I suppose that sums it up well. Well, Any... look what they've done. They've been heroes. They've been heroines in war. Yes. They yeah. have been totally uh, oblivious of any danger. Sometimes and... they've been tools. They have been total tools, mm. yes. I suppose we all are sometimes. Well, all of us are, yeah. yes. 
but that is it. That is a terrible thing. You can train a dog and you can, you can uh, bring out its salient points. But you can't and stop I... it being a total tool. No, very no. not. All right, let me tap your opinion on a suggestion that a previous caller made, that a snake containing a stick of dynamite should have been sent in to Saddam Hussein's bunker. Do you feel sorry for it? Yes. Stick a dynamite inside it? I hate to say I do, because that, ca uh, that snake, if it had any chance at all, it would get out of his way. Sure. And he, it would have to be timed so that it would just, just catch it at that moment. Otherwise, you'll find it probably when he's going to the loo, because it'll have slithered out of, the, uh, uh, out of the place and out of his vision. But one snake less in that instance, do you think it could be justified? I think so. Is there any other way that we can expose ourselves to animals in such a way as to learn? Yes, I've learned a tremendous amount from a social, sociological point of view, um, how to behave when you are mixed with people that you don't know. So, sociologically, how does the study of strays help you, say, when you're presenting yourself at a film premiere? Well, I think I've learned never to be aggressive, and I think that's really what it's taught me to do, much more than uh, against my instinct, against my nature, not to be so impulsive. So you would don the mind and indeed don the beard of a stray dog when you went into that situation? Uh, yes. And if you were donning the beard of a dog, it would be one that you knew well? Mm-hmm. Right, oh. Katie Ball, thank you very much for joining us on this issue. <laughs> thank a you A lot for of asking. valuable points there, and your call has liberated a just dog. Ah, oh, I'm so glad. And it's nice to talk to you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm Peter Hamill. Those were your calls on animals and justice. If you didn't get through this time, do join us again and contribute next time on Call 1FM. Call 1, 1, 1, 1, FM, 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 FM. Mm. Okay, you got it? Yep, got it. Okay. Right. Well, let's dish it down. What have we got inside Emma Thompson's right, uh, trash can tonight? Um, I've got cardboard negligee. Nice. Right. Look at these. A couple of, um, couple of nylon Fred Wests. Oh, lovely. Oh, beautiful, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, God, this is horrible. Oh, that's horrible. Uh, sort of drawing of Helena Bonham Carter being eaten by a huge pig or something. Oh, very nice. By the way, that was horrible. Parliament and flashlight. Yeah. Okay, Emma, yes, mm -hmm. uh, Emma Thompson's trash can. What else have we got? A yeah. spherical yeah. bib. Look, yep. spherical bib, cruel but effective. A yeah. uh, piece of plastic piss. That's good. Yeah, very, very good. That. Yeah. yeah, you can keep that. You can right. keep that. Uh, yeah. What's that? What's that? Where? Where? It's Where? in a Willie John McBride uh, cake kit. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I used to have one of those. I used to have one of those ages ago. Yeah, I know. Right, and there's one other thing here which I've got, which is what seems to be a Femidom stuff with spent shotgun cartridges. There's, this looks like the bottom of a letter here, which, yeah. um, I don't know, it's kind of like a torn off thing. It's, um, the name Oriego. It hasn't got the first bit on. Yeah. Uh, all I can make out here through this, it's kind of like I had coffee spilled all over it. It says straight off the foil, or best of all, as an enum. <laughs> and there doesn't go any more than that. <laughs> um, well, that seems to be it. Yeah. It's a rather empty trash can, but slightly yeah. revealing. Do you know she's going out with it at the moment, by the way? Um, just have a guess. Uh, <laughs> on, you know, I was just talking about, thinking about libel. Um, well, Kenneth Branner, of course. Uh, no. <laughs> she's actually going out with Walter Matter. <laughs> she is. And you yeah. know Kenneth Branagh's going out with? Uh, Jack Lemmon? Drew Barrymore. Hey, yeah, I want to shoot, baby. Shoot. Uh, thanks, by the way. Cheers. Oh. Uh, were you chased by any animal or anything? Were you no. chased by anything? No. No, I, I did run like hell, though. No. You didn't even have yeah. a torch. Pardon? You didn't even have a torch. You just like... No, I just, uh, I ran in there. I sort of, you know, I leapt into the bin, grabbed the stuff, you know, covered in all kinds of rubbish. Better put it back. She'll never know. And, uh, hey, kids, remember this? I believe this is a trailer for Chris Morris, 9pm on Wednesday. Though, actually, if I stop to think, I'd realise it's just a trap to make me say rude stuff. Is that it? Uh, Neely, I'd just like you to read something filthy that you don't understand. No way you'll make me do that. Hurrah for furry hoops. All hail the purple vein junket pumper and praise God for parting the beef curtains. Okay, now in the interests of uh, showing your knickers on air, um, I just I went up to a couple of people, had a lovely conversation on a bank holiday afternoon about uh, this and that, uh, asked them to read that out and said, oh, I don't know what it is, I think it's an extract from a play or something, you know, some feeble excuse like that. I kind of disassociated myself from the script as much as possible. And um, when we got to the beef curtains section, she, she read it twice. And this was her kind of surmise of what it meant. Thank okay. you for parting the beef, and then the curtains come down. That's, that's right, that's yeah, yeah, because I said it was a play. <laughs> uh, uh, right, so that's that. That's my knickers. Um, now, earlier this week, I bumped into my man, Sergeant Murphy.
What's going to be the outcome of the strike? Well, I think it's going to be six to four against the Blues. Do you feel any sympathy? Yes, terrible pains in my back. Who's been looking strong at the moment in the strike? Yeah, Michael Aspel. What's my life? John Burt popped his head out of the top floor window and spat on the crowd. We can play all the 1922 films, he said. What about the Chuck Berry Collective? That'll be in the book. There's only 94 pages in it, but it'll be in page 99. What point did John Smith come in? Because this was shortly before, wasn't it? Well, he it? came in an angle of 45 degrees. Was he worth some Peter at the time? Well, he was helping him. He's a member of the Labour Party as well, of course. What chance do you give the prescott Tarbuck dream ticket? Yes, well, they're a cleaning firm in Hull. What about Blair? Well, I, I can't stand that chap. He's such an imbecilic. And he's only 44, you know. How many Blairs are there at the moment? Well, there's 12 at the moment, and they're expecting another one. What platform? F uh, platform 9 in apartment 4. And how many of the Blairs will survive? Not very many, I must say. Are they all the same age? Roughly about the same. Give or take a pound. So out of the 13, how many will survive? I say about 11 and a half. So how many would that be? Uh, none. Uh, Sergeant Murphy. Good to see him last week. Oh. Okay, we've just got time for the intro of this as well. It's got David Bowie. He got Uh, thanks to Ollie for tonight. Thanks very much to Peter Bainham. Uh, thanks to my legs for getting me here and shaking throughout the show. And uh, don't forget, tomorrow, Emma Freud, one of them's only frock jock, will have two heroin addicts fighting for a gram of horse in the big issue tomorrow just to show how degrading it can get. Peter Bainham, um, who can we, who can we, uh, we've got a couple of people in town. Yeah, yeah. Who've, um, well, Emma Thompson. Uh, yeah, Emma Thompson's around. in town. Okay, well, the, the deal here is that uh, Peter's agreed to go out and get uh, their trash can. Yeah, yeah. All right, so if you can do that in about 20, if you can make it 25 minutes. Yeah. I think they're staying in Bayswater. Okay, yeah, Bayswater. So right, Emma so. Thompson and whoever she's with staying Bayswater. in Bayswater, go and get the uh, trash can. Be back here in 25. Will do. Okay, see you later. And up next, uh, those calls, basically strike-busting yesterday, phoned up a few people and said, listen, can you give us a comment for the news 24 hours in advance so we can beat the strike? And they said, yeah, sure. Um, now, this deal with the news, basically yesterday there was threatened industrial action. So I phoned up a few people, said, uh, look, we're trying to plan ahead for the news, we're trying to record the news 24 hours in advance. Would you be able to do anything? I got through the Tory central office, they were more than obliging. They bent over backwards, they said, yeah, we could put you in touch with some top-level politicians, no trouble at all. So straight away they uh, put the phone down. Then they phoned up John Selwyn Gummer. Then I phoned him up two minutes later. Who turned off the lights? <laughs> only joking, or am I? I am the one and only. Just so happens I probably am. There was going to be a strike to bust today. I'm frustrated. There was no strike to bust. I did it all day last Tuesday. It's great fun. You just go up to the picket line, you bust through, you annoy everybody, then you go inside, make a load of private calls. Don't do any work. Ah. In certain circumstances, it may be necessary and sensible to administer a smack to your child. Okay, so in today's toxic gob, your chance to speak in call 1FM. That's our new phone in with Peter Hamill, the subject today, Animals and Justice. We'll be looking at strike beating. What happens if you call up Tory Central Office and ask them for the news 24 hours in advance? We're trying to skirt possible industrial action tomorrow, which will threaten the news bulletins. We're not sure if it's going to happen. You may know the parties are at ACAS, but there is a threat of unofficial action. Right. By recording uh, as much of the news as possible today and then using it tomorrow. Right. Is there anything that you could say which would still be extant in 24 hours' time? Well, I suppose uh, I mean, we could find some ministers who might talk about the importance of the European, uh, uh, European election. The European uh, Yeah. More of that in ten minutes. 
Also, uh, if you want to call 071-637-4343 now, and uh, enough people call, I will repeat that up John libel that cost the BBC £1.5 million pounds in the week. There'll be opaque rambling from my man Sergeant Murphy. Human projectile Peter Bainham will bring back a celebrity's trash can. We'll sort out exactly who in a minute. We'll sort through the gin dinge and let you know what's there. Uh, we're reviewing the virgin book of legal highs. And... As uh, the news spouts ever more from the news horse, we'll keep you abreast of it. Uh, tonight, Jimmy Savile drops dead at a charity bash. The patients at Stoke Mandeville Hospital are not grieving. The majority, if not all of them, are extremely relieved that he's now dead. Although I suspect that some of them will be sorry that he, he didn't suffer a great deal more before. Yeah, you see that um, Max Clifford has been hired by the, the, the people who are alleging that Alan Clark had an affair. Well, the, the judge is alleging that Alan Clark had an affair with uh, all three of his ladies. And uh, I hope Max Clifford does better for him than he does for... Um, who was the previous client? Bienvenida Buck. There was... Um, I know, I saw it that actually the, the press launch of um, for four, four Weddings and an F that uh, he was still, still trying to get press for Bienvenida Buck. Um, what she was doing, she went Nicholas there. She got out of a taxi, uh, threw her skirt over her head, nobody paid the blindest bit of attention, got out, went round the other side, got in again, got out again, threw her skirt over her head again. Absolutely no reaction at all. Even started firing ping-pong balls off... Well, she stood on the top of the cab, started firing ping-pong balls Bangkok uh, whorehouse style at the press cordon. Absolutely no reaction whatsoever. Somebody sort of saying, oh, it said somebody put these ping-pong balls in the seafood. Nothing more. Um, I, I hope it does better for them. P Hello? Hello, is that Mr. Gummer? Yes. I don't know if you're aware of the situation, but basically there may be industrial action tomorrow which uh, threatens to undermine the news bulletins, obviously. Yes. And in order to supermount the trouble, we're trying to record as much of the news as possible today. Of course, I understand. So if there's anything uh, you want to say which you feel will be extant in 24 hours... Well, I think the thing that will be extant is the, um, uh, the major issue about vetoing. Right, well, can we record a statement on that now for tomorrow's news? Yeah. Um, one for tomorrow morning's news and one for tomorrow evening's news. Slightly different. I see what you mean, yes, indeed. So, so what would be the first one? Well, the first one is that I... Uh, I I'm, I'm very... Con I, no, it's... Sorry, I'll do it. OK. Let me, let me cut, I'm trying to think about how I do the two things. Yes. Sure. Over and over again, Britain needs to have her veto, not as a threat but because everybody then knows that when things 